What is going on everyone and welcome back to another episode of Drew Crime. I'm your host Drew V and this week I will be covering the very unforthcoming case of Alonzo Brooks. This case involves 23 year old Alonzo Brooks who died under some suspicious circumstances when he and some friends had decided to attend a farmhouse party about an hour away just outside of Lacine, Kansas back on April 3rd, 2004. It has been said that at one point there had been around 200 people attending this party, and by the end of the night, all of Alonzo's friends had left the party, leaving him there by himself. Alonzo would then go missing after the night of the party, and then about a month later, his body would turn up in a creek near the farmhouse during a search by his family and some volunteers. At the time, no one had any answers as to why or how Alonzo ended up dead in this creek, and in my opinion, local Lynn County law enforcement and the Kansas Bureau of Investigations didn't provide much help in seeking out the truth of the matter. The initial autopsy report was done by a crooked medical examiner who suggested that Alonzo's death could not be determined, and there's been much secrecy and speculation that lies within this case. Then after 16 years with no determination of how all this happened, Unsolved Mysteries aired an episode back in 2020 that brought much attention to Alonzo's case, even enough that the FBI would exhume Alonzo's body for a second autopsy, and in 2021 they would conclude that Alonzo's death was in fact the result of a homicide. In the last few years, Alonzo's story has sparked much chatter with people online, including many theories out there as to what may have happened to Alonzo on the night of the party but most would point to Alonzo being murdered due to racial tensions from other partygoers and the fact that he had been flirting with one of the local girls attending the party as well. This case will amaze you with the amount of holes that are in it, and Alonzo's case still remains under investigation, but still unsolved to this day. So in this episode, I want to talk about who Alonzo Brooks was while sharing the events leading up to his disappearance and being found. Then I would like to touch base on a few rumors and a well-thought-out theory that someone on Reddit has about this case, which will then lead me into my final thoughts and opinions on this case before I close the episode out. So please continue to join me on this crazy episode as I really try to help answer some questions that people may have about Alonzo's case, and just maybe someone listening that knows something about that fateful night on April 3rd, 2004, will decide to come forward with some new information that can help bring justice for Alonzo and his family. This is Drew Crime, Episode 11, Alonzo Brooks. He convinced me by the description, he was getting it off his chest. He was the first person, apparently, to whom he had really spoken about specifics of each crime. And he was getting from us. On my brother's birthday, which hurts very, very much. Did it matter? Yes, it does. The first thing that he did after I could close my mouth was just to ask God to forgive you because you didn't know what you were doing. No, Your Honor. Nothing, thank you. We did the thing, look. Now, before I introduce who Alonzo Brooks was and begin his story, I just want to remind everyone where you can find my Drew Crime episodes. I can be found on many major platforms, including Amazon Music, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, YouTube, and many more. I encourage people to leave comments on my YouTube channel for anyone who would like to discuss the cases I cover, and I can also be reached at my podcast email address at drewcrimepodcast at gmail.com. There have never been any arrests or charges filed on anyone related to Alonzo's case, and since this case still is under investigation with no clear or concise version of this story that has ever been made, anything I do cover in this case is based on evidence that has been presented to everyone through the Unsolved Mysteries episode, articles available to the public, and plausible rumors and speculations found on internet forums. Now with all of that being said, let's get right into who Alonzo Brooks was. 23-year-old Alonzo Tyree Brooks was born in Topeka, Kansas on May 19, 1980 to Billy Brooks Sr. and Maria Ramirez. 
Alonzo was the youngest of five children. He has three older sisters and also has an older brother, Billy Brooks Jr., who would later be part of his own search the following Monday after Alonzo went missing, and he's also featured on the Unsolved Mysteries episode as well. Alonzo's background was of African American and Mexican descent. He was said by friends to be a strong and athletic young man, and according to his family, Alonzo was somewhat shy, he was polite, a little bit of a neat freak, and very kind to everyone he met. At the time of his disappearance, Alonzo worked as a custodian and lived in Gardner, Kansas, which was about 50 miles north of where he and his friends would attend the farmhouse party just outside of Lacine. From what I have gathered in my research, Alonzo seemed to be a pretty great guy overall, so I'm sure that it makes it even harder for his family to cope with this death, being that they have not received the proper justice they deserve, and once we get to the end of the episode, it will be very apparent why. Now I'm going to go ahead and begin Alonzo's story starting on Saturday night of April 3rd, 2004 in Gardner, Kansas. But before I do, I just wanted to quickly point out that law enforcement had even said in this case that a lot of the times during the night of the party were hard to nail given it was daylight savings time. So the times I decided to go with in this episode were from Uncovered.com. So Alonzo and a group of friends, Justin Sprague, Daniel Fune, and Tyler Brohard, had all caught wind that there was a big party at a rented farmhouse just outside a small and predominantly white conservative town of Lacine, Kansas, which again is about 45 minutes south of where Alonzo lived at the time. The party included people not just from Lacine, but also surrounding areas ranging from high school ages to people in their 20s and some even older. And it's also been said that Alonzo may have already been drinking that day since noon, which could be a big reason why he was so reluctant to attend this party that night. After arriving at the party around 11 p.m., the group joined in on the festivities with the rest of the party, but Alonzo being of African American and Mexican descent didn't seem to vibe with some of the other partygoers attending that night. According to Alonzo's friends he was with, a racial remark was thrown out at Alonzo at the party, and before a scuffle would ensue with Alonzo and the other partygoer, one of Alonzo's friends Daniel would end up breaking up the two, and then all of the friends claimed that the night would continue on. According to an article by Daily Mail, they had been given the name of one out-of-towner who several different sources have claimed was identified by multiple witnesses as a guy who picked a fight with Brooks. Law enforcement at the time knew him as someone who, quote, liked to fight, and told Daily Mail that the young man in question left the party that night and made a drive of close to 200 miles out of state. Later on, when investigators caught up with him, he refused to talk or take a polygraph test, and Daily Mail was also told he had already, quote unquote, lawyered up. Now, in just a few hours of Alonzo and his friends being at the party, one by one, Alonzo's friends would start to leave the farmhouse ultimately leaving Alonzo by himself with now knowing little to no one at this party, and this would be the last time that any one of Alonzo's friends who left would ever see him alive ever again. So then as the next day approached, Alonzo's mom received a phone call from someone asking if Alonzo was home, but when Alonzo's mom went to check on him, she noticed that he did not come home from the night before. Being that it was unlikely for Alonzo to not come home from being out with his friends, Alonzo's mother started to become worried, and she called Alonzo's childhood friend Rodney English to come help try and locate Alonzo's whereabouts. Rodney was then accompanied by one of Alonzo's friends, Justin Sprague, who drove Alonzo to the party that night before, because Rodney had no idea where this party was held, so then the two headed back to the farmhouse to search for Alonzo. Also, this was the first time that Rodney had ever met Justin, and Rodney also did not know any other of Alonzo's friends that attended the party that night. Now, really quick, I just want to discuss who Justin Sprague is in this story, and many people, including Rodney, seem to think he lied about his accounts from the night of the party. Again, Justin drove Alonzo to the party, and at one point, Justin says he ran out of cigarettes, so he would leave the party with another buddy to buy some more and in the event of doing so, he would take a wrong turn out of the driveway of the party, where he would then get lost, mixed with some car trouble. Justin then says he calls another friend, Adam, that was still at the party with Alonzo, and told Adam he would not be able to make it back, so he asked Adam to give Alonzo a ride home. Real quick, I'm not really certain who Adam really is in this story, but I am led to believe it was just an alias name for a guy named Dane Hartman, and why this is, I'm not quite sure. 
Now, at some point after all of this happening with Justin, he was able to then get to a gas station where he would withdraw $200 from an ATM and then headed up to a strip club with his buddy before they would later be kicked out of there. Many people, including Rodney and Alonzo's mother, have questioned why Justin left Alonzo at the party that night, especially if he just planned on going to a strip club and not in return. But according to Justin, his story has never changed from that night, and in my opinion, Justin was in his late teens, he was drunk and high, so I really do think he was just making poor decisions that night, which ultimately did shadow him in a very negative light. But there is a lot of speculation out there that Justin did leave that night because he did see something happen to Alonzo, and was then told by other partygoers to keep quiet in fear that something would happen to him and the rest of Alonzo's friends. Remember, all of Alonzo's friends had left Alonzo that night, and not one of them seems to know what happened to him. And Alonzo's mother claims Justin changed his story six different times. In conclusion to Justin Sprague, I personally don't know if he's lying about that night, but there are a lot of questions that do linger in his story, and the whole going to get cigarettes part just doesn't sit well with me. Being that it was really late at night, most gas stations in small towns would have been closed for hours already, and it's also been said that you can visibly see town looking left coming out of the driveway of the farmhouse, but for some reason Justin took a right and then proceeded to get lost. His whole story is just a little bit weird, but I don't think there's really enough there at this point to cast any guilt towards Justin. So unless he did, in fact, see something happen to Alonzo and is just not saying anything, I really can't see any reason why people are out there giving him death threats when there's no actual proof of him having any type of involvement in Alonzo's disappearance and death. Don't get me wrong, he very well could be lying about what happened that night due to guilt that he may have had in leaving Alonzo, but for a lot of people to compare him to what we would have done as a friend really doesn't make him guilty of anything in this story besides being a shitty friend. Now, getting back to our story, as Justin and Rodney were searching the farmhouse property the following day on Sunday after Alonzo did not return home, Rodney would make a very surprising discovery. Towards the beginning of the farmhouse driveway, there was one of Alonzo's boot that was by itself, and then across the road on the other side of the driveway, Alonzo's hat and his other boot were then found as well. Then suddenly, a man on a four-wheeler approached the men and told them they couldn't be there and they had to leave, which further gave Rodney a feeling that something definitely wasn't right. Also, it was described that the farmhouse showed no indication that there had been a huge bash there the night before, so it looks like there was a quick cleanup job that did occur. Then the next day on Monday, after finding the items, Alonzo's brother Billy Brooks and his wife drove down to Lacine to talk with the occupants that lived at the farmhouse at the time, but they were told by the occupants that they had not seen anything. So Billy and his wife then went into town to drive around looking for Alonzo, and Alonzo's brother described some of the locals as giving them weird looks, which really gave them the feeling that they weren't welcome there. After searching for Alonzo, they then decided to contact local Lynn County law enforcement and report Alonzo missing. While at the station reporting Alonzo missing, the sheriff then told Billy and his wife that Alonzo was probably out walking around somewhere, but I think we can all agree here that that was most likely not the case, because Alonzo had no shoes on, no idea where he was, and where did law enforcement think he would just walk off to for two days? After this meeting, Lynn County Sheriff Department headed by Marvin Stitz said that they searched the property looking for any type of evidence, but they would find nothing. In the same week after finding nothing, the Sheriff Department turned over Alonzo's case to the KBI, who conducted a thorough search of the area, which also included search dogs and even an aerial search of the area, but once again, no sign of Alonzo anywhere. Then on April 10th, the KBI would decide to involve the help of the FBI, and the FBI would conduct numerous interviews with people that were at the party, and had even received some tips that Alonzo's disappearance may have been the result of a hate crime. Two days later, a diving search team would become involved. They searched in three-foot depth water in the creek that was near the farmhouse, but once again, there was no sign of Alonzo. And after this search, the dive team offered to come back out and look again, but according to their interview on Unsolved Mysteries, they were never invited back by law enforcement. 
So after the searches had been conducted for Alonzo by law enforcement and no progress had been made, Alonzo's mother and family had said they would like to come down and search the property themselves. But local law enforcement denied them of doing so based on their investigation. And the family had even called the sheriff's department every day up till this point in hopes for any updates on Alonzo's case. But they would just be told to quit calling and that law enforcement were working on things. Now fast forwarding a few weeks to May 1st, Alonzo's family and search volunteers were finally granted access to the farmhouse's property to look for Alonzo, and this is when they would make a very terrifying discovery. Within 90 minutes into searching the creek area next to the property, one of the search volunteers came across what looked like to be a body about 100 meters from the farmhouse, and once she got closer, she started to realize that the body lying in the creek belonged to her missing person. Alonzo Tyree Brooks. Alonzo's body was found fully clothed showing signs of decomposition, but not to the extent you would think the body would be in, being that it had supposedly been in the wilderness for the past 28 days, and I will talk again about this here shortly. Also found in Alonzo's body was a little bit of money he had, a ring, an ID card, some personal papers, and a lighter. The area had already been searched by law enforcement many times, so the questions here are, how did they miss his body on these earlier searches they made? And even a better question, how did his body even get there? Well, one theory law enforcement had was that Alonzo's body had been in a different area of the creek, and in time the creek water had risen, and he had floated down the creek to where he would later be found. Now again, there were no signs of Alonzo being submerged in water, and what's also interesting is that the belongings found on Alonzo were still intact with not much damage. So I think it's fair to say here that this theory of Alonzo floating down the creek doesn't really add up. So his body had to get there somewhere, but again, how? Also, I wanted to point out that the search dive team I spoke about earlier had also said in the Unsolved Mysteries episode that they would have in fact found Alonzo's body in the creek during their initial search, but then somehow mysteriously Alonzo's body would turn up later on the day of the search that included his family and volunteers. Now, later that same month when Alonzo's body was found, he would be examined by Dr. Eric Mitchell, and he concluded that there were no penetrating injuries, no fractured bones, and Alonzo may have died from drowning. But the big problem here is that there was no fluid that was found in Alonzo's lungs, and the body wasn't bloated, therefore he showed no signs of drowning. Also, Alonzo's soft tissues in his neck area had been so deteriorated by the time that they found him that Dr. Mitchell couldn't conclude whether or not Alonzo may have in fact been strangled as a cause of death. So in the end, Dr. Mitchell concluded Alonzo's death to be undetermined. Mitchell also concluded that Alonzo's body decomposition was consistent with a body being outside for 30 days, which many people, including myself, do not find to be true. Real quick, I do have to point out here that people have claimed that Dr. Mitchell doesn't always get it right when it comes to his findings, and Mitchell has also relocated to different cities many times, even having to resign in New York earlier in his career for some unethical behavior. So it's really hard to say here that Dr. Mitchell's findings are in fact very accurate, and if that's the case, was Dr. Mitchell just flat out wrong about his conclusions, or did he come to his conclusions in order to protect someone or someones? So after Alonzo's body had been found and numerous people had been interviewed from the night he disappeared, there was still no indication of what may have happened to Alonzo on the night of April 3rd, 2004. And Alonzo's case would then be closed in March of 2019. But then later on in 2019, the U.S. Attorney's Office for the District of Kansas and the FBI reopened the investigation of Brooks' death. And after about a year in 2020, Unsolved Mysteries decided to cover Alonzo's case, and by doing so, it brought much attention to this already very secretive case. And as I mentioned before, the FBI would then exhume Alonzo's body, and their experts concluded that Alonzo did in fact die of some type of foul play, and this homicide investigation remains open until this day. So now this is where I will conclude Alonzo's story to which many of us familiar with this case already know. And now I would like to get right into a theory I found on Reddit, including some of my thoughts and opinions on it, and then I will conclude this episode. 
Now, there are many questions that many others and I have about what may have gone down at the farmhouse party the night Alonzo Brooks disappeared. And like I had mentioned before in this episode, most point to Alonzo's death being the result of a possible hate crime. So before I do begin discussing this theory, I do want to say that I will not be using any actual names of people possibly involved that night. And this is due to the fact that they are just based on rumors and speculations. But the reason I choose to talk about this theory in this episode is because I do believe it is very plausible that some of these people that were there that night do know what happened to Alonzo, but they're choosing to keep quiet about it. So the Reddit theory I came across was posted two years ago, and the user who posted it was under the name Coven Holmes, which can be found in the Alonzo Brooks sub. Now, I'm not going to read it word for word, but I will best summarize this theory for you. This person's theory starts out that they believe Alonzo was murdered and that there was anywhere between 50 to 100 people that did attend the farmhouse party that night, which at the time was being rented by two individuals, and this party included locals from not just Lacine, but also Spring Hill and Gardner, Kansas as well. During the party, a fight had broken out, and this was potentially due to flirtation between Alonzo and another local girl attending the party. The user then goes on to say that this flirtation or interaction between Alonzo and the girl had multiple lines of corroborating evidence. A racist slur was thrown out towards Alonzo somewhere before, during, or after the fight, and this person is leaning towards racism being one of the main driving factors as to why Alonzo was involved in this altercation but in the end, they weren't exactly sure. The theory then goes on to say that the fight was eventually broken up and resolved superficially, but a party goer involved in the fight who did not let go of the situation decided to escalate this further later in the night when everyone else had forgotten it had occurred. It then goes on to say that one party goer had instigated the fight but did not escalate the fight further, then after that other people became involved, and this is when it would get out of hand. This all was corroborated because apparently there was other party goers that heard about this fight going on and they even said they decided to leave the party that night out of fear. So after this part of the story we know for a fact that Alonzo's friends all left the party at some point and next in the theory is where it talks about Justin Sprague. This theory then goes into talking about why they think Justin may have left the party that night without Alonzo and it wasn't because Justin needed more cigarettes, but instead he left the party out of fear of for his own safety. This person speculates that on his way back towards home, Justin would then call Dane, who was still at the party, to make sure Alonzo was okay. And this in return may have relieved some of the guilt Justin may have already had from leaving Alonzo behind. Now with Alonzo left by himself at this party, this person goes on to say that it's too difficult to speculate what happened next, but we do know whatever would happen next would result in Alonzo dying. So after most people's speculation that Alonzo had been jumped and beat up at the party, the theory then goes on to say that there are rumors that Alonzo was then placed in a local's shed or garage and was then tortured with an animal shock collar or even possibly lynched, hence the damage that was visible to his neck tissues when his body was found. Now, as I mentioned before, after Alonzo's body was found, the decomposition wasn't consistent with him being out in the wilderness for almost a month, so this theory then goes on to say that Alonzo must have been put somewhere for the time being, such as a freezer, and that this freezer belonged to a well-known family that lives in Lacine, who I believe owned a cafe that would have had a freezer large enough to hold a body. This theory then goes on to say that the family that owned the cafe probably had nothing to do with Alonzo's death, but did possibly have knowledge of what may have happened and decided to help whoever did this in preserving and hiding Alonzo's corpse during that time that law enforcement agencies were searching the Farmhouse Creek area. The theory then concludes with this person believing that all of Alonzo's friends wanted to tell law enforcement investigators what happened to Alonzo the night of the party, but out of fear of retaliation from the people responsible and the fact that they were so young at the time, they decided to keep quiet. As to why they may have feared these people were due to the connections that possible culprits had with a corrupt Kansas City judge at the time, plus the family I just mentioned who owned the cafe, which I have learned is a local Lacine family that you do not want to mess around with. 
In conclusion to this theory I found, I do speculate it to be very plausible as to what may have happened to Alonzo during and after the night of the party, or at least something along these lines. I don't believe that there were many people present at the party that were willing to say much when this tragedy occurred, but since so much time has passed, people are now willing to do some talking, which in return has given us some actual eyewitness accounts from that night, mixed with some very plausible rumors that I just discussed. Whether or not any of these rumors hold true, again I do think something happened to Alonzo that night that was race related, which then turned into a hate crime that included a massive beating that Alonzo could not endure by himself. Then, the rest was covered up by local people and officials, and this is why it had taken so long for Alonzo's case to finally be reopened and now re-examined by the FBI. Now as to another couple reasons why I speculate this may have been a hate crime, there is a rumor about a girl who had been bragging to someone else that her family, who I do believe some were at the party that night, were said to be racist and could make people disappear. Which she then goes on to say that she had a black friend who she would take to Lacine sometimes just to mess with him, and she would tell him that he would end up the creek just like the last one. One of the reasons I also speculate that this crime was race-related is because one of the witnesses interviewed from the party had said that they heard someone say, quote, I am going to kill this N-word tonight, unquote. And if true, I think we know exactly who they were talking about. In conclusion to this episode, I do feel that there's a lot of information out there about what happened the night Alonzo would disappear and then later turn up dead. But for any of this information to truly make sense, someone is going to have to do some talking, or the FBI is going to have to put all of this together and somehow make it all make sense. Alonzo's family has suffered far too long in not knowing the truth of what happened to Alonzo, and with this investigation reopened, I'm staying optimistic that his family just may find that day of justice that they've been longing for for so long now. This is a case that I'll be watching very closely from now on because there are so many unanswered questions that I still have, much like everyone else. So on that note, I wanted to thank everyone for tuning in to another episode with me. Again, Alonzo's case can be found on Volume 1 of Unsolved Mysteries on Netflix, so I do encourage anyone who is interested in this case to watch the episode, and I also do encourage people to visit the Alonzo Brooks sub on Reddit, because there is a lot of interesting information, speculations, and rumors on there that, in my opinion, are very helpful in researching this case. And for my next episode, I will be covering the unsolved case of missing person Amanda Dean, who has been missing from Huron County, Ohio, since July of 2017. So make sure you stay tuned for this next one. And my always friendly reminder to all, love everyone, but trust no one. I'm your host, Drew V, and we will see you on the next episode of True Crime.